politically charged TV shows, B-movie transformations, and a completely unexpected Tom Cruise performance. Sometimes, sci-fi remakes are way better than the original. Remaking a classic film is always a dangerous endeavor. The 1958 version of The Fly is a perfectly entertaining B-movie with some creative special effects and some solid jump scares, and an intriguing gimmick. While it's a fun midnight movie to watch if you're into science fiction from the 50s, it isn't necessarily a classic. Notorious cult filmmaker David Cronenberg decided to rework the concept and turn it into a powerful human tragedy with 1986's The Fly, a more terrifying and emotional film than its predecessor on nearly every level. You've got to get some help. I think you must be sick. Jeff Goldblum stars as Seth Brundle, a brilliant scientist who's convinced that he's discovered a way to transport materials between two chambers. He uses his computer to reproduce organic tissue, which has the potential to radically change medicine and scientific research. However, after his crush, Veronica, played by Gina Davis, leaves to visit her ex-boyfriend, Seth begins drinking, and his experiment goes horribly wrong. When Brundle tries to transport himself between two pods, a fly accidentally sneaks into the chamber with him, and the combination of their DNA begins to slowly turn Seth into the monstrous Brundle fly. The film shows how he gradually loses his humanity, Instead of using the Hulk and creature he becomes as the source of cheap jump scares, Cronenberg shows how debilitating disease can be, especially for someone with a work ethic like Brundle's. It's horrifying to watch such a likable character transform into a monster that we no longer recognize. There's always an inherent danger when American filmmakers choose to remake classic international movies. That certainly wasn't the case when Steven Soderbergh remade Andrei Tarkovsky's beloved space classic Solaris. His 2002 update captures the same eerie tone and mind-blowing visuals of the original, but intertwines the narrative in a slightly more compelling way. It's certainly a close call, but Soderbergh's film is more rewatchable, emotionally engaging, and thematically rich. Both versions of Solaris are inspired by the 1961 science fiction novel of the same name by author Stanislaw Lem. The 2002 film stars George Clooney as the psychologist Dr. Chris Kelvin, who receives a proposal to assist in a mission to the space station Solaris. During his voyage, Kelvin begins having strange visions of his dead wife, Rhea, played by Natasha McElhon, and he starts to lose his grip on reality. There's also a deep sadness in Clooney's performance, which ranks among the best of his career, making Solaris endlessly watchable. Fans of Frank Herbert's Dune were excited when Racerhead director David Lynch was hired to direct an adaptation of the first book in the series. However, the 1984 film fell short of most people's expectations. Even though Lynch is one of the best directors of all time, he was put under creative restraints and did not get to make the film that he intended. Since a director as talented as Lynch couldn't make a good Dune movie, some people simply assumed that the novel was unfilmable. However, director Denis Villeneuve found much more success with his adaptation. While Lynch's film tried to compress the entire story into one film, Villeneuve chose to split the story into two separate projects. Dune Part 1 focused on Paul Atreides, played by Timothy Chalamet, and his rise as a leader. By giving the audience more time to adjust to the political terminology and world building, Villeneuve was able to make Paul a more inspiring character. The remake also brings each of the novel's stunning locations to life in immaculate detail. Between the incredible action sequences, Hans Zimmer's electrifying score, and the unique costume design, 2021's Dune is one of the most technically impressive films ever made. 1956's Invasion of the Body Snatchers incorporated some of the most relevant political issues of the era. The concept of alien creatures replacing humans may seem silly, but Americans had been suspicious of each other throughout the Cold War. As a result, the paranoia over aliens shared commonalities with the search for communist sympathizers during the Red Scare. When director Philip Kaufman approached his 1978 remake, he chose to tackle many of the same themes, especially as the 70s were also filled with intense paranoia after a series of political scandals. Many political thrillers from the era dealt with suspicions about being watched. In Kaufman's version, the scientist Matthew Bennell, played by Donald Sutherland, starts to investigate a mutilated corpse at a mud house. Bennell discovers that a race of extraterrestrials is slowly invading society by taking on human form. The film unravels like a procedural thriller, and spends time showing the extent of Bennell's research, grounding the story in scientific principles that made the pod people seem like a plausible threat. The use of silence during the climactic sequences only contributes to the film's eerie vibe. While Invasion of the Body Snatchers avoids cheap jump scares, it has one of the most chilling final shots in science fiction film history. The 1962 French short film, La Jetée, is one of the most influential works of time travel fiction. The 28-minute film explores a post-apocalyptic dystopian version of Paris and follows a nameless prisoner who is sent back in time to his childhood before World War III. Brazil director Terry Gilliam decided to expand La Jetée into the science fiction film 12 Monkeys. 
Gilliam's adaptation follows a prisoner named James Cole, played by Bruce Willis, who was held captive in a post-apocalyptic version of Philadelphia. Cole is sent back in time to find a cure for a pandemic that has swept the world. It's believed that a group of environmental extremists known as the Army of the Twelve Monkeys initially released the virus. Get it. Monkey. Monkey. Twelve Monkeys sustains its premise thanks to Gilliam's visual idiosyncrasies, in which the future is stark and terrifying, and the present is so eerily realistic that it's even spookier. Willis gives an incredible emotional performance that ties in beautifully with the film's tragic ending. The 1995 adaptation of the Judge Dredd comic book series is one of the most disappointing superhero movies of all time. Instead of respecting the character's gritty origins, the film turned into a generic Sylvester Stallone action vehicle. Luckily, 2012's Dredd was an improvement in every way. Pete Travis treated the film as a shocking 1980s-style action movie, with gruesome death sequences and insightful political commentary. 800 million people living in the ruin of the old world. Dread takes place in a dystopian future where police officers serve as judge, jury, and executioner. The veteran Judge Dredd, played by Carl Urban, reluctantly takes a younger judge under his wing when he's assigned a drug bust. Dredd is sent to break into a massive building where the drug lord Mama, played by Lena Headey, has her stronghold, where she sells a powerful hallucinatory drug known as Slow-Mo. The film uses immersive 3D effects to make the violent action sequences even more brutal. John Carpenter has redefined nearly every subgenre of science fiction and horror, and 1982's The Thing is a tightly wound masterwork of suspense, action, and some of the most impressive makeup effects in cinema history. The Thing was loosely inspired by 1951's The Thing from Another World, and both films are adaptations of John W. Campbell Jr.'s 1938 novella, Who Goes There? The Thing from Another World is a perfectly serviceable sci-fi monster movie, but it's not that distinct from other genre movies of its era. Meanwhile, Carpenter's film understood that there is nothing scarier than paranoia. In the 1982 flick, Kurt Russell's R.J. McCready and the other men in the Arctic Research Station all turn on each other as they question which one of them has been taken over by a mysterious creature. While some audiences might assume that the classic Universal monster movies were all campy horror flicks, many were remarkably sensitive and creative. For instance, James Whale's 1933 adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel, The Invisible Man, tells the tragic story of a scientist who is trying to cure himself of invisibility. While Whale's The Invisible Man is great, Lee Winnell's 2020 remake updates the story from a female perspective. In Winnell's version, the titular Invisible Man is the optic scientist Adrian, who had been abusing his girlfriend Cecilia, played by Elizabeth Moss. He was a sociopath. He said that I could never leave him. When Adrian mysteriously disappears, it's assumed that he's dead. However, Cecilia discovers that her ex has used the invisibility suit to cloak his actions, allowing him to continue his abuse in secret. As is often the case, no one will believe Cecilia's version of the events. Wanell was able to turn this classic tale into a story about the importance of believing women, and Moss's powerful performance was flawless. Beginning in 1936, the Flash Gordon adventure serials made a huge impact on the science fiction and superhero genres, making them incredibly important if you consider yourself to be a sci-fi buff. After the success of Star Wars in 1977, there was more interest in the science fiction genre than ever before. Although the Flash Gordon film was only released a few months after The Empire Strikes Back, it wasn't trying to achieve the same goals. Flash Gordon was cheeky, self-aware, absurdly comical, and certainly not trying to elevate the material. Sam J. Jones's performance as the titular hero is playfully dull, and it's hilarious to watch Flash fumble around in his own movie. Max von Sydow's eccentric performance as the villain Ming the Merciless steals the film, and an incredible soundtrack by Queen is the icing on the cake. Richard Matheson's 1954 novel, I Am Legend, has inspired many adaptations, including 1964's The Last Man on Earth and 1971's The Omega Man. There's a reason that this story is worth reinventing for different generations, since it's a gripping examination of loneliness and the triumph of the human spirit. Francis Lawrence's 2007 adaptation focused on the inspirational quality of Matheson's narrative, implying that, even on the brink of extinction, humanity is able to ensure its future. I Am Legend rests on the shoulders of Will Smith, who plays U.S. Army virologist Dr. Robert Neville. He is immune to a virus that has swept the world and believes that he is doomed to live alone for the rest of his life. Lawrence beautifully intercuts footage of Neville's daily routine with flashbacks to his life before the virus was unleashed. It's inspiring to see him overcome these tragedies as he searches for other survivors. Let's be frank, the 1978 science fiction series Battlestar Galactica was a cheap ripoff of Star Wars that failed to last beyond one season. While the show has admirers, it hasn't aged well, and is largely indistinguishable from the other Star Wars knockoffs of the era. However, that doesn't mean that the universe that Battlestar Galactica created wasn't an interesting one. 
In fact, former Star Trek The Next Generation writer Ronald D. Moore revamped the concept into one of the most politically relevant television shows of the 21st century. The reboot of Battlestar Galactica was an improvement on the original in every way, and even managed to right some of the wrongs of the Star Wars franchise. While the Star Wars prequel trilogy failed to make its political elements compelling, Battlestar Galactica served as a relevant metaphor for Bush-era events. Alejandro Amenabar's 1997 Spanish film Open Your Eyes is a complex examination of the meaning of life, but it's also emotionally grueling. Despite typically being known for his romantic dramedies, Cameron Crowe decided to remake the sci-fi-infused movie with 2001's Vanilla Sky. Crowe's adaptation follows Tom Cruise as David Ames, a wealthy man who is irreparably changed after a car crash. Somehow, Vanilla Sky blends emotion, surprising humor, and splendid visuals to make the story of Open Your Eyes even more entertaining. Although Vanilla Sky was critically derided upon its release, it has since found a cult following.